Welcome back everybody to another Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast. A little bit different today because we're out on the launch of the Honda Trans Alp. So I thought I'd get someone who knows their stuff <laughs> to, come <that>? give, <laughs> to come and give me a hand. So I'm joined by James Oxley, your editor at large, let's say, or editor in chief. Editor at large at the moment in <laughs> Portugal, but now editor of Adventure Bike Rider magazine. Perfect. And uh, yeah, well, let's cut to the chase. You've joined us mainly to add to the content, but I think we can also give a little bit of a shout out to the ABR Festival, which is coming up this year. I'm gonna be there. I think Tim, who normally does the podcast with me, might come along as well, it'd be my plus one. Uh, but yeah, tell us a little bit about it. Well, you know, I think it leads quite nicely into the fact that we've ridden the Trans Alp today, and the Trans Alp is gonna be one of the many, many bikes you can test ride at the Adventure Bike Rider Festival. Uh, we like to call it Glastonbury with motorbikes, posh toilets and hot showers, and it really is the greatest celebration of adventure biking you could ever dream up. And it's, you know, it's, it's hosted by bikers, for bikers, and it's the, the type of festival that the team at ABR and Alan, who heads up ABR and founded it, wants to attend. So as well as having the, the world's leading motorcycle manufacturers with their test fleets, the likes mm -hmm. of Honda, Ducati, Yamaha, and so on, um, there are masterclasses where you can learn everything from putting up a tarp to uh, how to tour around the world, uh, how to change tires and whatnot. We've got the uh, the celebrities of the adventure biking world, the likes of Moto Bob. Lovely, uh, the thank likes you. Of, <laughs> um, Ryan F9 we had last year, um, authors, social media stars, kind of, you know, real experts and superstars in the adventure biking world that you can meet, chat, learn from. Perhaps one of the main attractions is our 20 kilometer off-road trail through the magnificent grounds of the Ragley Hall estate. And it is an absolute treat to ride in the UK for 20 kilometers uninter uninterrupted through vast open grasslands, woodland areas. It's a, it's a brilliant trail. Um, and the idea behind it is that if you've never ridden a bike off-road before and you've got a big adventure bike, be it yeah. uh, an Africa Swing, a GS or whatever, um, you can come along and comfortably ride that trail and enjoy it. There's a dedicated beginner's loop as well if you've really never ridden off-road before yeah. to get your confidence up. But there are also sections that are posted throughout for people with a bit more experience so they can kind of test their skills as well. Mm. It's, it's everything you could ever dream of having in a motorcycle festival, an adventure biking festival, is there and we've got live music going on throughout a huge beer tent huge variety of food to choose from all in this grand country estate in warwickshire Perfect. So please do come along. It's going to be a brilliant, brilliant festival taking place on the 23rd to the 25th of June this year. And you can get your tickets at www.abrfestival.com. Very nice. And yeah, I'll be there hopefully doing a talk a little bit about how to make, you know, videos of your motorcycle travels and a few things that I've learned over the years that hopefully I can pass on to the punters at the festival. So I'm really looking forward to it. Now, today we're talking about the Trans Out. We've got a little bit of a Q&A episode. We've been doing these on the launches recently where it's mainly been me on my own. So oh. I'm quite looking forward to having a, a foil. Is that the right word? A foil, partner. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And uh, we'll start with some of the Facebook questions. So you can join our private Facebook group on, well, if you search for the Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast on Facebook, we let everybody in, but it's private, so we can boot people out if they spam, basically. Fair and also enough. give a thinly veiled um, air of exclusivity. You're on quite a power trip there. You can yeah. boot out whoever you want. We did it once. It <laughs> felt great. Yeah. I'm just kind of hoping someone will come and spam. Is your so mum allowed back in? Is it okay? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, our first question is from Outlaw Creations. He's got a couple, actually. Firstly, what is the seat height like and does it feel less heavy than the Africa Twin? So it's 850 mil, I believe, in the seat. It is, yep. And you're a big fan of the Africa Twin, so how does it feel to you comparing the two? Yeah, I'm a massive fan of the Africa Twin, actually. I'm a massive fan of the Africa Twin's engine. Going back to the seat height, I'm around six foot tall. Mm -hmm. I can get both my feet firmly planted on the ground with leg bend to spare. And that's something that I always find encouraging when I'm jumping on an adventure bike. Yeah. Um, it just is confidence inspiring, particularly for people that haven't got as much experience as riding as others. So yeah, that's great. Does it feel like the Africa Swim? Um, I would say in essence, no. No? I don't think it does. No, it's a, it's a, a smaller machine. 
Um, the Africa Twin, I think, is a great bike, but when you get on it, it feels like you are on a big bike, doesn't yeah. it? It's, it's, it's got a lot of road presence. It's, Definitely. Um, whereas this does feel, to me, it feels quite lightweight, uh, quite agile, and a very approachable and friendly bike. Yeah, <laughs> if I that's think, the word I you could use. Right. I mean, you know, the question, I suppose, is does it feel less heavy? And so, absolutely, I'd wholeheartedly agree. If you're someone who's wanted an Africa Twin, maybe demoed one or been to the adventure experience and thought, oh shit, this is a bit big for me, or I think when it's fully fueled, it can feel a little top heavy, mm -hmm. then the Trans Alp is probably a great shout. Um, because it gives you some of the same brand image. It is the same engine configuration, although they do feel quite different. But yeah, it's a lot more accessible, a lot less in intimidating, I would say, as well. Equally, we talked a bit about the CB500X earlier, didn't we? We did, yeah, I used to own one. Did you really? Mm, yeah. Well, there you go. Great bike, but it does feel a little bit lacking in road presence, I think would be a fair way to put it. You know, the benefit of that bike is it's nimble and, and frugal and all those things, but the Trans Alp does genuinely plug a massive gap in the range there. It's a big jump from the CB500X up to the Africa Twin, and so this fits almost perfectly directly in the middle. Now, next question is, this is also Outlaw Creations, by the way. For light gravel and long distance road touring, would you have it over a Tiger 660 or Touareg? Now, have you ridden? I have, yeah. Both? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Great stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've <laughs> re re reviewed help. both uh, Adventure Bike Rider magazine and had the Touareg for about six to eight months as a long term review bike. Mm. Yeah. Excellent bike. Or not? Yeah, yeah, great bike. I, I think thought so. <laughs> going to the Tiger 660, very different animal. Yeah. Um, the Tiger 660, I kind of see as, uh, it's kind of a mini sports tourer. Um, and actually yeah. that was one of the surprises of, I think it was last year that I reviewed that bike. Uh, it's just brilliant. Yeah. It's such a Excellent. great little bike. And I didn't have high hopes for it. I don't know why, but I, I did some, I did a decent distance. I did about four or five hour stints on the motorway on that. It was brilliant. Mm. It was really good. But it's a road going sports tourer. It's not designed for riding on trails. So mm -hmm. if that is in your, your riding makeup, um, then, you know, it does rule it out. I would say so. Yeah, definitely. They say for light gravel. So um, certainly I'd put that in the no column for that. And the Touareg, I would say, is probably at the other end of the spectrum. So in the middle, I would say you've probably got the Trans Alp, which is, a, it, I think, being designed to be a reasonable balance of the two, you know, roadability and a bit of gravel. Yeah, the Tiger's a road bike and I wouldn't take it off road. The Touareg is more biased, I would say. It feels a bit more tall, yeah. it's got a bit more travel. The, it's the Touareg is probably one of the bikes I've most enjoyed riding off-road, just right. because of its standing position. Mm. It just feels, it, it's perfect for my muscular body shape. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you stand on that Touareg, it just feels so planted and so stable yeah. um, that it can't help but inspire confidence. It, it is a great bike. The suspension is a bit spongy. Yeah. There's no getting away from that. But off-road, that's you know, that's quite a good thing when you're coming across some, some deeper ruts and, and some rough ground. But um, that's why I'd say, you know, that it doesn't make necessarily as good a road bike as perhaps the other two. It's fine on the road. It's quite good fun. But you do notice that it's tall, it's got a lot of travel, and it's pretty soft, so. I think the Trans Alps design more as a road tourer than yeah. the Touareg, yeah. So distance road touring, possibly, I'd even, potentially, I'd have to do a bit more testing. I might even take it over the um, Tiger 660 for road distance touring as well, just because it has, I think, a little bit more space on the Trans Alp. It's a bigger bike, so yeah. it's more, the Trans Alp's more substantial than the Tiger 660. Uh, gives you that upright riding position, wider bars. Totally. Um, so in terms of long distance comfort, um, it, it actually, it's got it nailed. Yeah, I mm. think so as well. Next up, we got Chris J. Kirkham, and he says, love these Q&As. Podcast is top tier as always, so uh, that's not even a question. It's just someone it's said to me nice, and I wanted to leave Someone massaging your ego, why not? <laughs> it's your show, enjoy it. Exactly. If you want your question to get in the show, actually, that's a very good way to go about <laughs> Tell it. Rob how wonderful he is. <laughs> That's quite sad, isn't it? <laughs> What's the real draw factor of one of these, say, over the heavier weight Africa Twin? I'm in the market for an Africa Twin, but feel one of these could potentially be a decent contender as a competitor. Now, there are some key features, I think, of the Africa Twin that mean that potentially you might want to look at it. Things like cruise control, which is just not available on the Trans Alp. So if you're doing longer distances and you really want that. Also, the sort of, um, well, your favorite thing, I think, about that bike is the engine, isn't it? Yes, such a sweet engine, it really is. Uh, 
And I think the interesting thing is there's not a lot of difference, like 10 horsepower. And yet, um, what is it? 350 cc bigger. You know, you take half of the Transalp's capacity, add it on top. That's a much bigger engine, not making that much more peak power. And I think that's because that's not really the name of the game. It, it's all about mid-range and torque and being able to plod away. And it's so satisfying to ride. So for me, I think, yes, it's a little bit heavier, but yeah, that might be the reason that you might want to look at the Africa Twin. Cruise control for me is a big one. Any other reasons off the top of your head? I just think that, so the Trans Alp is going to be an easier bike to live with. Mm -hmm. um, now I caveat this with, I love my big adventure bikes. I'm on a GS adventure at the moment and they are my bike of choice. But if you're looking to commute through a city, mm -hmm. something like the Trans Alp, it's more slimline, it's a bit lighter, it's going to be easier to slide between cars, bump over totally, pavements, yeah. things like that. It's going to be easier to slip into parking spaces, mm. stuff like that. Um, even little things like moving a bike around your driveway. My driveway is quite narrow and sloped. You know, mm. a big adventure bike is difficult to do that. The joy of the big adventure bikes like the Africa Twin is just that long distance cruising. Mm. There's comfort, there's power. And if you ride like I do, two up regularly, and mm. me and my wife tour an awful lot, I always go, for a larger bike. Mm -hmm. uh, one, just because there's more space for the two of us, but two, having that extra power just makes cruising with two people and luggage a lot easier. So it always comes down to what you want to do with the bike. Mm. You know, do yourself see yourself commuting through London as I used to on my CB500X mm -hmm. and then heading over to the Alps in the summer? Well, then, you know, something like the Trans Alp is actually a much better idea. But if, you know, your riding is pretty much kept to, I don't know, weekend blasts away over to Wells or something like that, and then summer tours, that bigger Africa Twin with that power carrying capacity, you know, is going to be a winner. I think also a little bit about how you like to work the engine. You know, if you're someone who likes to rev it out, you might find it a little more rewarding on the Transalp, whereas the, the Africa Twin doesn't have that top end necessarily. It doesn't have a, a big difference, really. It su feels super linear to me, but it does like to just whiz through the mid range and really has that gutsy side. So that's another thing to consider. But as always, you know, you can listen to us to chat away and give you some information to be informed with, but you'll never really know until you demo them. And where's the best place to demo them? Uh, the Adventure by Rider Festival, oh, yeah. where you'll be able to ride both. <laughs> I was going to say Fowler's in Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all seriousness, the Trans Alp and the Africa Twins will be there this summer. Perfect. So if you're looking to ride them back to back, it's a great opportunity too. And whilst Fowler's in Bristol, it is one of my favorite dealers and it's a great place to get lots of different brands. All dealers are probably not going to love it if you take their demo bikes off road. So that's a really unique thing about ABR, isn't it? The yeah. ability to be able to do that. That's uh, one final thing on the Africa Twin is that it is brilliant off road. But being a big adventure bike, you've got to be more confident in your ability. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're confident on the trails, then that Africa Swing will do wonderful things. Yeah, uh, I'm a very average off road rider. I'm always always the first to admit that I enjoy riding trails, but yeah, I don't power slide around corners very often. But, um, but I thoroughly enjoy riding that Africa Twin off road. Put a pair of 50-50 tires on it and you're away. I'd massively uh, encourage people to try the the adventure experience as well. I think it's really good down in Devon, but. I think the fact that part of that course is how to recover a large adventure bike. So if you're if you get stuck halfway up a climb, they teach you to um, sort of wiggle the front wheel to get it pointing back mm. downhill, so you can have another go. Some of those teachings are brilliant, but I think it is also a sign that look, this is a big bike. You will need a few tips and tricks to be able to manage it if you do get yourself in a tight situation. Perhaps for some people, the lighter Transalp might be a good shout. Again, Chris J. Kirkham asks about the touring capabilities uh, and says, as mentioned above, uh, obviously we won't have any competition on a GS, but would it actually be good? What I found interesting was there's some good accessories. So you can get like the three piece luggage. It's plastic, but it actually looks all right, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Pretty decent. There's a lot of space for the passenger as well really good substantial metal grab rails, which I think is great if you're on the back of a bike for a long amount of time. As the rider, plenty of space as well. Uh, the only thing I found interesting, there's no touring windscreen accessory as far as I could see. There's some extra deflectors. Um, what did you find the wind protection like? I thought it was pretty good actually. Yeah, yeah a big bugbear of mine is always a non-adjustable screen and the bike 
I think you can adjust the screen, but you need tools to do yeah, it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wish you could just go up and down, but I won't bang on about that because mm. I always do. But I actually think the Transalp is a really going to be a very, very good touring bike. I'll caveat yeah. with the fact that we did about 190 kilometers today, um, mm. and a lot of it was very twisty, snaking yeah. roads. It wasn't your typical French toll roads down to the Alps, but it's got everything in place to be a really capable long distance tourer in terms of comfort, wind protection, Protection, power, um, yeah, certainly. I would not hesitate to head off on tour on the Trans Alp. Yeah, I thought it was good as well. What I kind of get annoyed with is maybe when a windscreen is a little bit too tall as well. Like there's a mm. sweet spot for me because yeah. sometimes you end up with that real buffer in because it's almost going over your head but not quite. And I found the screen on this bike to be around chin height perhaps, and I felt like there was some clean air on the lid which wasn't too um, hectic, let's say. Yeah. So. Although it's not full coverage, I think it's it's good enough. Uh, Chris also asked, what's it like off-road? We only did, what, five miles today? Yeah, yeah. What would you think? Yeah. Is that enough to evaluate it? Not, not hugely, no. So the, the trail we did, the trail we did was actually part of the Dakar Rally. Really? Yeah, which was cool. Yeah, yeah, when the Dakar Rally started from Lisbon and okay. went down through Portugal. Um, Amazing trail. Yeah, yeah, but it was very much um, dirt road, yeah. wasn't it, rather than off-road, and it was a public highway. Um, but it was like hard, compact ground, bit muddy, bit slippery, bit of gravel, yeah. but, um, but gave us a, a feel for what the bike was like. And it felt, it felt nice and stable, felt nice and well-balanced. Um, one of the good things about these bikes is there's not a huge amount of power to get you into trouble, is there yeah. really? Um, I did try the gravel mode, which is kind of an off-road mode for the bike, isn't it? They said it's kind of like a nanny mode though. That yeah. It's quite a lot of traction control and a very dull throttle response. And I found climbing, uh, the TC was getting quite keen yeah. and really slowing you down. I think that's why the user mode is also there. You can, f you can still switch off ABS and you can dial down TC and give it a bit more uh, throttle response. So I think that's what they suggest. If you're advanced off-road, use user mode. Yeah. Gravel mode, I think, was just like a, I've not done much and I just wanted to save me, perhaps. Yeah, it, it, it was a bit, bit too intrusive. Uh, yeah, I found definitely. so switched away from it. But yeah, the bike was, and that's the joy of riding something a little bit smaller. Mm. Is that the smaller the bike tends to be the more fun you're going to have off-road. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably fair. Recently, uh, Yamaha announced this extreme edition of the Tenere, which I'm sure you're across, but mm. um, it's basically the suspension off the World Raid, so a little bit taller, and a taller rally seat as well, and it's 9, 10 mil in the seat height for this extreme edition. Now, I think that's a really clear indication of like Yamaha's intention with that bike and where they see it positioned and the sort of image it has. And the fact that it is really good off-road, especially with that suspension upgrade, because I tried the World Raid and I thought it was really good. I think the counterpoint to that is the Transalp. I feel like giving us five miles on that bike today and the way that they've sort of marketed it, it's not intended to be a Tenere competitor, I don't yeah. think. It's not as tall, there's not a massive, you know, there's more ground clearance than a Hornet, but it's not up there with Africa Twins and uh, Tenere's and things like that. And uh, yeah, so it's probably good enough for gravel, I think if you want to go touring and perhaps there'll be some broken pavement and there might be a campsite down a sort of gravel lane or something like that, perfectly fine. Probably in the right hands, really capable. I mean, if you're good enough, this thing will fly. Yeah, like, it'll, it'll, it'll do be, the job. It'll, well, it'll be incredible. But what I like about it is if you're not good enough, if you are very average, like I am off-road, it, it's just easy. It's yeah. easy to jump on and head down a trail, whereas something larger and more powerful is going to be a bit more, more intimidating. You might not have so much fun. Yeah, ultimately, you know, easy to get on with. It's got the right wheel sizes, but that also gives you the good choice of tire sizes. It's got the right modes. The engine feels fine in the low revs. They did a little bit, they said, to tune the air intake versus the Hornet to give it a bit more torquiness in the low revs. And so it's pretty good off-road. I think that is the verdict and the answer to Chris's uh, question. But we, I wouldn't say that we, you know, took it down some really tight technical lanes we just you know didn't have the opportunity slash i don't have the skills and I'd, <laughs> I'd be, i'm better off probably on that kind of trail he also asks let us know whether it's actually something you'd spend your own money on which is we had a little brief conversation about we this while we're we out on the bikes and i think it's a really interesting question because we haven't talked about the price. £9,499. Yeah, that's really good value. It's aggressive, yeah. isn't it? And yeah. you get a lot of features. You get a lot of tech, you know, five levels of TC. 
um, five levels of five rider modes rather. Um, engine braking control, ABS settings with off-road modes. You've got uh, Bluetooth connectivity, self-canceling indicators. You know, good components, spoke wheels and decent brakes and decent-ish suspension. You've got preload on the front and rear. Uh, what else? Good power. V very good power figures for that sort of price. And then we were like, well, would you spend your own money on it? And I think the verdict was maybe as a utilitarian tool at that price point it's a really good purchase yeah so i did buy i spent my own money on a on a 500x which mm -hmm. looks very similar to the trans out totally yeah yeah just a, a smaller version so i guess my answer is probably yes because this is what i probably would have loved that 500x to be a bit more powerful better brakes better suspension i think whether we phrased it is it it might not be the bike that i put on my wall as a 10 year old boy and dream of owning. Yeah. But if I'm looking for a bike to actually do the job and to do multiple jobs, whether that's commuting, touring, weekend blasts, it's exceptional value. And there's not really anything on that bike I can pick out and say, that's where they scrimp to save money. Mm -hmm. There's a few things missing. There's no cruise control, there's no heated grips, but as an overall package for that price, it's it's really impressive. A grip's a an accessory. Yeah, probably. I hope so. Hope probably. so. But yeah, not as standard, and we didn't yeah. have any bikes to try them on. I think it's a really good kind of um, summary because let's say you had in the garage your dream bike, whatever that may be. You know, something like a, for me growing up, it'd be like a Ducati nine one six or something. Yep. Imagine you had that bike, beautiful looking. Take it out on a sunny day, not very comfortable, probably breaks down a bit, but a real, you know, characterful piece of art. It would kind of make total sense to have something that's nine and a half grand and can just do all the other biking that you want to I do. I guarantee you'd ride this one more. You reckon? <laughs> yeah, you'd ride the Trans out far yeah. more than you would that 916. But I think that's where it, where it does fit. I, it's hard to see it being anyone's like dream bike, as you say, but I would spend my money on it. I don't know if I'd pick one of the competition first, I'd have to do it like a group test or some demo rises. It's such a tough question. And I think I get, we get this quite a lot, you know, these kind of questions. It's like, on the one hand, someone who's doing motorcycle journalism, you, you'd hope they're very well placed to say, should I spend my money on this? On the other hand, it's almost too difficult to answer because you've got exposure to so many bikes. And again, what I would recommend is, I would demo it at very, very least. It would be on my shortlist for middleweight adventure bikes. And so I think that's the important thing that we can get across is it's a very capable and feature laden bike for the price. As for whether you should spend your money on it, well, you've always got to go and ride it and you'll know if you find that connection with the bike. Yeah, I reckon I would buy one. Would you? Yeah, yeah. I'm not in the market for a new bike at the moment, but it's certainly a bike I'd spend my own money on. Would you save up an extra three grand and get an Africa Twin? Potentially. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Honda will be happy with that, so <laughs> we can move on. <laughs> All right, we're over to the YouTube questions. We got a lot here, so I didn't actually, uh, I don't think we'll get through all of them is what I'm trying to say. I've ordered it by top comments, so the most thumbs up uh, are the ones that we are going to tackle. And I think we might have to rapid fire through these a little bit, mate, because there's a lot. But sometimes, Traveller, you got the most thumbs up on your comments. So a very well, well done. done to you. Maybe you were really hit, hitting those sort of key questions that some other people were thinking of. But uh, first one is fuel efficiency and expected average slash max range values. Now, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to fire up Google here, but it's a 16.9 litre fuel tank is so that right yeah they claim or honda claims 54 miles per gallon which theoretically could get you 242 miles from a fill up as we all know in reality what manufacturers say the mileage is and <laughs> <laughs> the reality is often very different um i wish I, I took a photo of my dash so i could figure out uh what our mpg was today but it wasn't near that yeah, well, uh, this is a funny thing, right? Because I'd agree that, um, you know, perhaps the, the figures are uh, quite favorable sometimes, but I think what they do is test it. Like, let's say you're uh, just riding on the motorway and you, you keep a steady throttle. What kind of um, returns can you get? And I, I generally find, you know, I've tried it with stuff like the Tiger Sport 660. If you sit at 16, 70 and, you know, are pretty steady, you'll find you can get somewhere near those figures a press launch, though, is an absolute yeah, smash fest. It's, it's the worst place to try and figure out an MPG yeah. in the real world because I literally spent half my day in second gear. 
yeah. dashing between turns. Yeah. Willfully so, burning fuel, I would yeah, say. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's literally hairpin after hairpin, which yeah. just doesn't exist in the UK. And I don't ride that fast at home. No, like, I think I chill out I really a little don't. bit. Yeah. yeah. But what do we do? 190 kilometers, what's that mm. in old money? Uh, 150 miles, <laughs> something less, like that. I, I, think it's like, I think it's less, let me, let me translate that for you. 118. Is it? So we, I was on my final bar of fuel when we stopped to fill up at the end of the day. Yes, yeah, so I think that's probably about right. I mean, if you look at the official figures, like you say, they claim, I'm always in, I know people talk miles per gallon, but I really like the uh, litres per hundred kilometres that all the manufacturers use now. Yeah, I use litres for the tank, but miles per gallon <laughs> exactly. for the mileage is, yeah. Uh, and you can, you can just take the capacity and divide it by this per hundred kilometres and get, so anyway, yeah, they're, they're claiming 4.4. Uh, which would be 384 kilometers or 238 miles. I was finding, after I reset the, uh, the what's it, the average consumption thing on the dash, with this kind of ridiculous kind of um, quick riding with a lot of throttle, we were getting about six liters per 100 kilometers, which would be more like 281 kilometers or 174 miles. But in reality, it's probably still a little bit less than that. I mean, what do you reckon? If you, 60 on an A road, Steady throttle. Yeah, how often are you going to do that, though? <laughs> All the time! <laughs> I, think, I think, my gut feeling... I like, think 150 would be easy. Like, we get to ride a lot of bikes. Yeah. My gut feeling is, from that 16.9 litre fuel tank, you'll be looking at 200 miles from a tank, you'll be looking to fill up from about 170, 180. I think that's pretty reasonable. But you know, that's just gut feeling. It's not based on any math or anything like that. I'll do that when I write the review for APR magazine. Oh, what? I thought we were getting the full treatment. Um, yeah, I think that sounds about right. And honestly, I normally, after two hours, need to stop for some sort of um, the petrol station sweet snack. Coffee, so, or, or a coffee, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm pretty happy with that sort of mileage. Um, this is a, a kind of thing we've touched on already, but sometimes Traveller asked about cruise control and might it ever become an option. I talked about this in my review. I would have liked to have seen it as an accessory. It's not a standard. You can't get it on the Tenere, to be fair. You can't get it on the new V-Strom 800. But yeah, personally, I'd like to see it as an accessory. Street Triple, for example, last week that we were on, it was like a couple hundred quid just to get a new switch cube and then you get cruise control on it. And mm. it really is a feature that some people seem to say, I don't understand why you would have that on a bike. Why would you even go on the motorway? I just ride on Sundays and I just go on twisties. And then people who ride like you and I, maybe touring or for work as well, have yeah. to take the motorway sometimes. Far too much motorway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you're like, I wouldn't buy a bike without it. And so I think as an accessory, if you're on a premium bike, you, you'd expect that to be included anyway. But where, where the price point is tight, and you can see that they've tried to build it to an impressive price point, I would just like to see it as an accessory. I think that's, that's what I would like, but I doubt that's gonna happen. I think they're gonna keep a bit of a gap in capability up to the Africa Twin, and I don't see them, you know, next year saying, oh, here's a new set of buttons for it, realistically. Maybe, yeah. Connell O'Reilly asks, is the bike built down to its price or does it feel better than the price tag suggests? There's, I, I think I said earlier, I was, I was vlogging as I was um, <laughs> riding along for, uh, for a video to check out on ABR's YouTube channel, but um, there, there was nothing there that I thought Honda have scrimped on, mm. which is great. You know, the, the brakes did a great job, the suspension, did a solid job. Everything, everything felt as it should be. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, and that's probably the most impressive thing when you think about the price point, is that, I don't know, you think about, think about the Tenere. Mm. Cracking bike, really enjoy it. Probably the one thing I'd like to see improved would be the suspension, or they have with the new version. Mm. Whereas on the Trans Alp, did a really good job. Well, that new version of the Tenere, you know, I don't think it's UK, uh, like available in the UK, but um, France, Germany and Italy are getting it or something, but it is like touching 12,000 euros. So even though they've kind of somewhat rectified it, um, you do have to pay more for it. And I think that's what's so impressive, this price point. And it, it really doesn't feel like there's a massive scrimp in anywhere. Um, I will say, 
often launch prices are different to what the price will be next year or the year after. I've seen that oh, a few times go up. recently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think um, at the moment it looks like exceptional value. If you're really keen on one, that would be a decent, obviously that's why they do it, but that would be a decent reason to pick one up soon. But yeah, I don't think there's any, um, any massive areas. Maybe the headlight. It's CB500X, isn't it? It looks a bit like that. Yeah, although we haven't ridden in the dark, have we? So it's always a difficult thing to... Yeah, I was just thinking of the, the yeah. visual vibes. Yeah. Um, um, but honestly, if you're happy with that and you like the way it looks, I mean, a day's riding. If we got a long term, you might find out, you know, some stuff that, that maybe t deteriorates. But generally, it looks exceptionally well specced and up to what you would expect from Hon Honda's build quality, despite this kind of very um, impressive pricing. Okay, GTO, due to the fact that I stick with my beloved 1100 Africa Twin on my off-road trips, I would mainly use the Transalp on the road. Therefore, I'm interested in its performance going fast on the road. Please talk about the potential of the engine, the suspension, whilst pushing the pace, and what about the balance and center of gravity? The engine seems to be superb. Please ask Honda about a supermoto style bike with this engine. Anything planned? Question mark. Wow. And then a winky emoji. That's quite a detailed question. Yeah, so... Um, That's interesting. They've interesting. got a twin, but thinking about getting the Transalp as well. For road riding. I, yeah, the thing is, I love riding the Africa Twin on the road. Mm, yeah. I think it's as, it's, as the big adventure bikes go, yeah. it's brilliant fun to hoon around on in the Twisties. Yeah, I love absolutely. it. So um, I wouldn't want to put you off buying a Transalp, but you've already got a cracking bike on and off-road. Personally, I'd go Hornet. If I had, a, if I had a, an Africa Twin, and maybe I'm into the Honda brand, you do get this. Certain people just resonate with a certain manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'd be looking at potentially... Yeah, the Hornet. Although it's quite low in the seat, the Hornet. And so maybe this is someone who is a little bit on the taller side. And so uh, maybe it does make sense for that. As a, a sort of road riding experience, we talked about how we didn't do a great deal of um, off-road today. But what we did do a huge amount <laughs> we did a hell of was a lot, like yeah. nailing it out of the corner, hitting the brakes, turning it in. And then doing the same thing a hundred times over because Portugal has some of the best roads, I think, in Europe for that sort of thing. And the Transalp has that um, automatic hazard light alert, doesn't it? So if you yeah. hit the brakes too hard, your hazard lights flash. In an yeah. emergency, it's a great safety feature. It was just flashing on and off all day today yeah, on pretty yeah. much every bike I saw because the riding was so much fun. You know what? That's kind of interesting, though, because I kind of don't know why more cars and other vehicles don't have that feature. That is a good shout. Yeah. You know, it... it it really is very useful when you're doing that sort of thing, when you go, oh, hold on, you know, they're braking quite hard right now. Yeah. And, and it did make me think, well, the brake light could be anything, couldn't it? It could be just have your finger on the lever or it could be like yeah. slamming both brakes on. So I was following you a bit today and yours were flashing away. You were, yeah, you were enjoying the that's, ride. That's, that's a signal that I'm constantly <laughs> miscalculating. When you see those mid corner, you know you've got problems. I need to get back to super bike school or something. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was very good. I mean, obviously, you know, there's not a great deal of adjustability in the suspension. It's mainly preload. So if you're someone who's like really looking for a bike where you can tune it to how you want it to handle on the road, you know, it's not built for that. It's meant to be this kind of adventure tourer, all rounder. Um, and again, the brakes, I think have lots of feel and a nice power, but it's not like an initial bike because they need to be usable off-road as well, where you've got less grip. And so if you're looking for that more responsive, quicker handling kind of bike for sporty road riding, like I say, personally, I'm good for something uh, road biased. Uh, this is by its very nature and by design an all rounder. Uh, David Swordplay, wonderful name. That is a, I think I, I might I, change I mine. really hope that is his name. Yeah, James Swordplay yeah. sounds quite good, although it does James sound a, maybe play. a bit saucy. I know, I know. My <laughs> wife might not enjoy that nickname. <laughs> or she might, who knows? <laughs> yeah, it also sounds a bit medieval. It's sort of like, a, anyway, I'll, I'll move on to the question. Does it have. And then in quotes, character. Uh, I don't know why character's in quotes there, but does it have character? I'm not in the same way the Africa Twin does, no. Mm, the Africa Twin's got that guts. And you know what's interesting? James's bike is a Bonneville. And so <laughs> yeah. I think that, that sort of, um, that engine as well, the Bonnies, and that's why I love the Bonnies and had one for a long time, was like, yeah, that, that, that engine is also built for that really gutsy low to mid range. This bike has got more of a, I don't know, I'm trying to sort of relate it to something that more people might have ridden, but 
I always think of like KTM's when they build a parallel twin. Mm. It's it's not got that um, weightiness and substance. It's more like revy and can go up and down the rev range a bit quicker. It feels lighter, even though it's the same configuration and same um, you know firing intervals. So. As for the engine, yeah, it doesn't have that no, but I guess meatiness. When you talk about character, the, the ultimate definition of, of a bike with character is, say, a, is a Harley, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Something yeah. like that. You know, now the flip side of that is they can be quite difficult to ride <laughs> um, and have their quirks. Um, whereas this, the Trans Alp is the complete opposite of that in mm. that it is a really approachable, well-made bike that you jump on and just go. Um, you know, it's, 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 such a, it's such a good little machine, but a flip side to that is no, it doesn't have kind of lots of character as resonates and mm. so forth through the through the engine and through the bars. Um, if that's something you're looking for, you know, the Honda probably isn't the bike for you. Mm. I think it does have like some sort of uh, things that you learn about it as you ride it. So like there is a bit of a surge of urgency and excitement as you get to like maybe five or six thousand lpm and it sort of comes alive a bit and it's more that kind of top end yeah. and I, I think that yeah like you say when you think of character you think of this more low revving like the sound and stuff i do like that they've tuned the exhaust on these they've got two exits one for bass one for sort of raspiness yeah it's got a bit, of, quite a, nice bit of a raspy howl isn't it when we were doing the uh what, we were doing the photo runs what i always like is yeah the, oh, that is exactly what i was going to say when when you're in a big line maybe 10 of you, and you get set off at 30 second intervals, just hearing someone absolutely nail a bike from a standing yeah. start down, down a straight bit of road. Uh, and it does sound good, but I think that is a fair point. This is a, an exceptional utilitarian tool um, that just has a, you know, a nice sound as well and a bit of interest to the engine. But yeah, I think what's most impressive about it is everything that it can do and all the features at that price point, not necessarily like the, the, the sort of old school move the soul kind of uh, vibe. Urban Adventurer. This bike is going to get compared to the Tenere, Touareg and Bistrom 800 a lot. How does it compare in your eyes? And is the speculation that it's more street orientated than off-road orientated true? Yeah, we talked a little bit about this already. We talked about the Tenere, we talked about the Touareg. I don't believe either of us have ridden the Bistrom 800. I didn't go yet. to that launch, no, no. No, it does look great things. Oh, really? Yeah, our chief bike tester went and was, was seriously impressed with it. We'll have to um, reserve judgment on a personal level, but that's a good sign. I do know it's a little bit more weighty and a little bit less top-end powery, so um, I don't know how that plays into it, but then, you know, there's always the X factor and just like the je ne sais quoi of a bike, so I'll go with an open mind. I think it looks quite interesting as well. Tenere Touareg, I think, are more off-road biased. And I think that is accurate. It is a little bit more road biased than those options. Frederick Hansen, I'm most interested to know if the suspension is good enough for this price point. Only preload pre adjustment seems quite cheap, but the price is not so low. So the question is, is it really worth the price? Yes. Yeah, it is. The, the suspension was great. Um, yeah. And I really, it, it, it really shone for me when we were riding through countless fast twisting rows and that the bike felt so confidence inspiring it felt so taut in yeah. that situation i i don't remember there must have been but i don't remember fault dive mm. you know and it's yeah so it's comfy i would say you know it's got like a bit of squish when you sit down but yeah it does hold itself quite it well was, so. it was it performed very very well for a bike of that price yeah a lot of these questions really depend on where you're coming from does it have character if you're coming from the harley if you're coming from whatever it's difficult to say whether that's gonna suffice for you same with the suspension if you're coming from bikes with like full adjustability or you've got something with like the latest olins or you've like upgraded your own bike maybe it's not going to feel like that um, but I think just for the price point, and that is the question, is it worth the price point? I thought it was good as well. 100% yes, yeah. Tons of bees, great username, love that. Hoping to hear if the ground clearance is enough. For like pootling along on some gravel roads as, as we did, absolutely. If you're going full send, like, and you watched a few Paul Tarrant's videos and you're expecting to be able to do that, then definitely it's less than some of the other, you know, the Touareg, the Tenere, it's, le it's less than those bikes. But I think it's just a question of being honest with yourself, what sort of riding you're going to do. Well, it's 210 millimeters, isn't it? And mm. uh, we've got a bike behind us here, which the camera probably can't see the ground clearance, but that one in there mind. we go, yeah. It's a decent amount, it's a healthy amount for a all-rounder 
mm. uh, or potentially more of a road focused all rounder. So I think the type of person that would buy the Trans Alp, and I'd probably count myself as one of those people, there's enough there. I think that's a, a good summary. So RJ, not the RJ, you know RJ is Royal Jordanian's sort of, um, do you know Royal J Jordanian? I do, I do. Yeah. yeah, people call him RJ in the comments. So there you go. I'd love it if it was him, but I don't think it is. Anyway, low ground clearance and low exhaust. The Trans Alp is clearly more road focused than off road. Full stop, not a question mark. I said that's we move agree. on from that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I will say um, it does look a bit vulnerable where the exhaust is positioned. But on the flip side, the accessory um, belly pan certainly looks substantial and robust enough for sensible moderate off-road riding. I think for what yeah. the bike's designed for, that belly pan will give you enough and, and the bars. And I think it's important to bear in mind that this isn't uh, a mid-size Africa Twin. It's very much a bike yeah. and it, it comes on its own terms and it's not as off-road fo off focused as the, the standard Africa Twin. So um, that statement by RJ is correct, but I don't see it as some sort of damning indictment. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just by the nature of, of what the bike was designed to do. Now, more loud Hamdok says, does it go well with pastel de nata? Oh! I'm lost there. You've, you've not been buffing up on your Portuguese Cuisine. I've not. I know Opera Guard. <laughs> and that was a. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you must have known. Well, I think I said, when I said we're coming out here, we're going to Portugal. Pasta and Anata are the um, custard tarts with the sort of uh, burnt top and the flaky uh, pastry. what we had at lunchtime. And we did. No, well, on, the, the on the coffee stop. Oh, God, they were delicious. Very good. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, wonderfully I think it does with pasta and anata. Well, that would be an interesting um, podcast idea to do food pairings with certain motorcycles, like in the same way that people do food and wine. That'll be our yeah. next episode. Or? Yeah, let's do that. I think we should uh, do a little road trip based on that one. <laughs> Normally, I shoot my main YouTube review, which will be up soon or probably already up actually versus this podcast. But uh, I shoot that on the lunch break, so I skip lunch. So the coffee stop before that, I go pretty, you know, Did you wild. skip lunch? Yeah, I skip oh, lunch. Lunch was good. Yeah, but I'm veggie, so... Was it meaty? Uh, it was very meaty, but it was delicious. <laughs> yeah, it really was great. But I did nail loads of custard tarts to make sure that I could get through the day. Nice. And, and I had no repercussions. So yes, it pairs perfectly. Probably that suspension we were talking about, you know, sat well in the stomach. JRN, how do the ride modes differ and how much can you really adjust the custom mode? So uh, does the custom drive mode really feel like it can be tailored to different skills? So beginner, experienced, advanced and expert. And could this truly be the ultimate Swiss Army knife middleweight adventure GT bike? So I think the adjustability is great. Like it is frustrating. For example, I was thinking about the street triple when I was on the launch the other day, they've now made it so you can really dial, dial back the ABS. But I think some track riders on those launches, certainly the previous gen were like, it's still too much. And they kind of want the option to turn it off. I, I know there's difficult, difficulties around um, legislation and stuff about switching ABS off, but I think if it's an off-road bike, you can kind of do that. And I felt like the Trans Alp really does allow you to do quite a lot. TC, ABS, you know, um, you can switch both those off, I believe. And there's an ABS off-road mode where you can switch the rear wheel, rear wheel off, but still have the front on. Power modes, um, engine braking modes. Uh, so what have we got? It's, it's five levels of traction control, isn't it? Yeah. Four power modes, yep. three engine braking, two ABS interventions. Yes, I'm gonna say that I'm quite lazy when it comes to this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. In the, you know, I've, I've had an Africa Swin as a long-term review bike for a while, mm -hmm. um, and I left it in tour mode the vast majority of the time. Did you really? Flicked it around for reviews and you know, so to find out what it's like, but left it in that. But the different modes on this bike, actually you do, they, there is a discernible difference. So um, Sport does give you that sharper throttle response to the standard, which is basically road tour mm. mode. Uh, rain does soften things out a lot, which I put it on for a little while today and then swiftly came out of it, but you know, it was raining. Um, so yeah, they are discernible differences. And if you do want to tweak your settings to suit your personal riding style you can um, I just don't ah. very often I feel like the, the difference was quite noticeable so rain mode versus sport mode I think that's what you want a pronounced difference and the ability to dial it in yourself if you're in sort of JRN's um, you know situation of wanting it to be very um, uh, customizable so I, I think it for, for the price point it offers a lot in that respect do you know one of my favorite things though very briefly was just coming out of a corner in sport mode and just pinning yeah. the throttle and the bike just it never got out of shape yeah it's so good it was so much very fun. impressive yeah, isn't it? Yeah. On, on that sporty stuff uh, especially given the wheel sizes and the tires were on Metzler carries 
streets, but they're still semi sort of knobbly, semi off road. Uh, it really was good on the road. Uh, as for whether it's the ultimate Swiss Army knife middleweight, again, I think that depends on your personal circumstances, but for the price, it's it's got to be on the short list. I think commuting, yes. Touring, yes. Weekends away, yes. The trail riding is probably the the weakest element of all of those. Light light off roading. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, it's cool, cool. That. that's yeah. you. That's great. If you're if you're into harder core off roading, maybe look elsewhere. Denise Devine says, "Ask someone from Honda. We've got a couple of Honda people in the room, but they're on the phone. <laughs> Ask someone from Honda if a crossover turns out with a 17-inch front wheel is in the making, and they absolutely will refuse to answer that. I don't think so. I don't think there's any plans. No such plans. No such plans. Wouldn't that be? Sort of the N, is it the NC750 then yeah, sort of thing? Well, it'd, be like, like a, it'd be like a Tracer though, like, you know, more yeah. of a, a bit more sporty because the NC is not like particularly built, you know, it's got a really approachable like low center of gravity, yeah. but I wouldn't say it's, it's built to handle. But yeah, anyway, no such plans was the official word there. Martin Morgan, hi Bob, love your reviews. Told you, anyone who compliments me gets in. Uh, would the new Transalp have a low seat option? It does. Does it? How much did it drop it by? All right, I want to say 810 millimeters, but there is a low seat option yeah. and you can drop it down. Don't worry, yeah. don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. But yeah, uh, there is one, Google it and you'll find out how much lower it is. Sorry that we can't be of more assistance. Rick Smith, when is it planned to release in Canada? Absolutely no idea. Then is the throttle mapping different from the Horner? Does that have that different tune? We talked about the intake lens. If you look at the power figures though and talk, they're like 0.5 of a horsepower or 0.5 of a newton meter or like 250 RPM out. So if they have changed it somewhat, it's not massive. I don't think it's a huge difference from it. Fundamentally, it's pretty much the same engine. You'll just notice a much bigger difference in how the bike behaves because of the chassis, because that is like so different, you know, wheel sizes, height of it, the, the weight of it is very different. So well, I've never ridden the Hornet. Have you not? No, but I've got I'm, one at the moment. Have you? A press bike. Yeah, you have I'll to come down. Over, have a go. Yeah. Um, but what I will say is, that engine is just a peach. It's great, isn't Such it? Such a great engine. Yeah. So much fun um, and so versatile that you, you just won't be disappointed if you ride it. I agree, yeah. That, I think when I came away from the Hornet uh, launch, you know, I said, I think that the engine is probably the best thing about it. The whole bike is great value for money, but to get something with 90 horses that revs out quite nicely, it feels like quality, you know, and um, it's fun to ride, it's quite lively, uh, yeah. Genuinely, it's a, it's, a, it's a great feature of both bikes. Last up, Ren. Does the dash and connectivity work? And is it easy to use? Does it feel as though it could last a lifetime? No tech is gonna laugh, last a lifetime in terms of connectivity. We'll all be plugged into the metaverse and just riding virtual bikes within about 20 years, probably. Is this Zuckerberg your his way, way of saying that you didn't connect your phone to the TFT, well, so you're avoiding it? Because nor did I, I have to admit. I think there was a period of time with motorcycle launches where connectivity was becoming a more common feature on mobile bikes. And I went on quite a few launches where they were like, we really want to show you these new connectivity features. They're really amazing. And then you'd be stuck at the hotel just helping everybody pair up their phones. <laughs> yeah. When it, all anyone wants to do is get on the road and give the bike a we proper did that. good ride. We did that at the motorcycles we launched, didn't we? The V85 yeah. TT. Yeah. Spent quite a lot of time in the morning huddled around bikes, trying these lovely, lovely Italian guys trying to explain to us how to connect our phones to the motorbike. Um, what I would say about the TFT is it's great, easy to read, simply laid out. Um, it's so easy to get those dashes wrong, mm. but Honda have done a good job on it. I think they have, yeah. One thing I've thought about the Africa Twin in the past is like it's quite sterile looking perhaps, um, especially with the white background. It reminds me a little bit of like medical uh, equipment, yeah. you know, like very, but with this bike and the Horner and possibly even some Africa Twin situation now, I'm not quite sure, but certainly with this one, you've got four layouts. So one that looks a bit more like a traditional analog speedo, one that's got the more the kind of like bent bar across the top like a BMW, uh, one that's more like a yeah big rev meter in a semicircle, 
And then you've got three backgrounds. So you can go black, which I think looks quite cool. You can go metallic, which has this kind of like sheen to it. And then you've still got the white, which is my personally my least favorite. But when it's very bright, actually, it gives you the best visibility. So I think they have implemented all that stuff quite quite well. It's but easy to use as well. Yeah, they, they've really also- Really simple to navigate. They've slimmed down the number of buttons on the switch gear versus something like the uh, Africa Twin. Oh God, yeah. NT, NT11. A, third of, a third of the number of buttons. And it's just so simple to use simple to navigate, intuitive. It's, I think they've nailed it, absolutely nailed it. And I'm not sure I worry massively as well. Like if I can't pick something up within you know, a few minutes and maybe by the end of the day, I've got it. Most people don't just ride a bike for a day. You know, it's kind of like reviewing a hire car almost, like can I get it immediately? Yeah. Um, most people hang on, hopefully onto their bikes for like a year or so and I think it's absolutely learnable and intuitive yeah. for, for, mm. for the period of uh, an ownership. So, yeah, thank you very much to everybody for their questions, including Ren for that last one. A massive thanks to James. Well, for being thank out. you for having me on. Uh, and oh, hopefully pleasure. see you and as many of you as possible at the Adventure Bike Rider Festival. June on a Trans 23rd to 25th. Uh, come and ride a Trans Alp. Come and ride an Africa Swim. Come and ride whatever you want. It'd be great to see you there. Uh, and just, yeah, grab your tickets at www abrfestival.com and also get on Facebook go in our private podcast group because if you want to submit questions for the next launch which will be the BMW R1250R and RS we've also got the Honda CL500 coming up what else have I got Yamaha Tracer 9 GT Plus and the Nikon the new one uh, then get in the podcast group and you can submit there and you'll be top of the list I always do those first for the loyal Facebook members uh, as well as the, the YouTube stuff. So thank you so much to everybody for your questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you to James. Thanks to Honda for having us on a double great checking that website address was correct. Does it work? <laughs> yeah, it's correct. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> Otherwise I'd be in trouble. And uh, yeah, thanks very much and we'll catch you in the next one.